Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Flourish. It's so good to be together again and um, on a beautiful Wednesday morning. Are you guys just loving this weather? Me too. Uh, We had a a love offering last week, if you missed it. We had pink envelopes at every table, and I wanted to give you guys an update on how much we collected between this group, the night group, who, by the way, didn't give as much as you guys, the morning group. Just had to throw that in. Uh, And then our online giving as well brought in a total of $1,404. Thank you guys so much. Uh, We have a a pink envelope out in the lobby on our purple monster, as we call it, here at the Grove. And if you missed out and you still want to give, you can just drop it in that envelope. Well, we have spring coming up uh, officially. I don't think spring starts until a little bit later in March, but we have some great activities, events coming up for you, for your kids, for your family here at the Grove. And uh, the first thing I wanted to let you know about is a spring tea uh, for our women, all of our women here at the Grove, not just if you come to Flourish, but Anyone, it could be your aunt, your daughter, your neighbor, your mom, bring all the girls and we're going to be out here on the Grove Lawn, 1030 on March 27th. You should have this flyer on your table so you can take it home and put it on your fridge. You won't want to miss this event. It's just going to be a relaxing time of getting together with your friends and your family. We're going to have tea. We're going to have scones, little mini cucumber cream cheese sandwiches, all the good stuff that you come for at a tea. But it's not like the Phoenician. It's not like $80 a person. It is $15 a person. Includes your lunch and it includes something called poor painting. Have you ever heard of that term pour as in pouring your paint? Uh, I had never heard of it, but Uh, Katie McDaniel, who's in our children's ministry, uh, does it. She's going to lead it for us. So you're going to get to take home a painting at the end of the morning. And uh, I brought a little YouTube video to show you what it's all about. So roll it, Erin. All right, so I think you can all do that. You have no excuse to say that you're not artistic because it's very easy. We'll have all of the supplies there for you. So please go to our website. It's uh, thegroveaz.org slash flourish, and there's a button that you can sign up online. So uh, we have one other event coming up that I wanted to invite you to, especially if you have kids the ages of four to fourth grade. Uh, We have our annual uh, Easter walk out here in our trees. It's an amazing event. Uh, Shelby runs it, and she is going to come up and tell you a little bit about it. So let's welcome Shelby. Hi. So the Easter walk is on Good Friday. Um, It is from, I think, 8.30 to 11.30 or 9 to 12. Don't quote me on that. 8.30 to 11.30. Okay. 
Um, anyways, so we at The Grove love Easter, obviously, and um, we really take pride as a children's ministry to not make it too carnival-like. Um, we don't do like the Easter egg commercial side of it because we want our kids to know the story of Easter. And it's become a um, not only event for our own kids at our in our Grove Children's Ministry, but for the public. I'm really sorry, I'm out of breath. <laughs> um, anyways, so we through the Grove, we have the five um, stations, and it's uh, the story of Easter. So as they go through each station, there's hands-on things, there's stories of what's being told, and then when they finish the Easter walk, there's food trucks, a petting zoo, face painting, so it's a fun, fun time. Your job if, is if you want to come volunteer with me, um, we are going to be passing around a clipboard. If you want to help in any capacity that morning, um, we have people dressing up as like Bible, I don't like saying characters, but you know, Bible people. Um, if you are good at organization, if you are good at handing out booklets or welcoming people or anything, we need about like 60 volunteers to make the whole thing run smoothly. So if you're available on Good Friday, which you all should be, you should come hang out with me at the Easter walk. <laughs> Because that is a holiday off of school, and it's April 2nd, so mark your calendars for that. Uh, we also have that evening a really cool Good Friday service in here that you're all invited to as well. So keep those things in mind as you guys plan for your uh, upcoming events this spring. Well, in just a second, Katie is going to come up, and she's going to lead us in a couple of songs uh, as we get going. I wanted to read this scripture to you because um, I don't know about you, but I was frantically trying to finish up my homework this morning, and uh, I'm so glad I did because day five was amazing. If you didn't get to it, you need to go back and get to it. Um, it's all about Mary Magdalene and her coming to Jesus with her perfume. She was the town uh, sinner, known as the town sinner. And Philippians 1, 6 says, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So uh, Jesus began um, a good work in Mary. He forgave her sins. And as we read in our homework, she went on to follow Jesus the rest of the time he was on earth. And she was mentioned seven more times in scripture as being there with Jesus when he was speaking, when he was traveling, she was uh, assisting him with all of his disciples. So uh, she carried on to completion uh, what Christ began in her. And that is so encouraging to me as we women are learning about Jesus and his teachings while he was here, that he can do a good work in you and in me and carry it on into completion. So let's pray as Katie comes on up and um, dedicate and commit this morning to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your grace, for your forgiveness, for your love for each and every one of us, that we can come to you how we are right now. We don't have to get our life together uh, to come to you. And uh, so we ask, God, that you will help us to continue uh, as we walk with you day by day, to stay in your will, to continue following you every day, and we uh, thank you for this time this morning. Would you be here with us? Would you bless it? In Jesus' name, amen. Troubled, 
hold your head up high, don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth, God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong, remember where our help comes from. is madly in love with you so take courage hold on be strong remember where our help comes from As Veronica was talking about Mary Magdalene, it got me thinking that we need to pour out our hearts the way that she did. We need to pour out our hearts and we need to follow Jesus. We need to give him every burden that we carry right at this moment because it's not ours to carry. And Mary knew that. She knew that she didn't have to carry it, so she laid everything at the feet of Jesus. And that's exactly what we need to do right now. Things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. And things that we thought were dead are breathing in life. Again, you caused your sun to shine on darkest nights. For all that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be our anthem song. And Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. 
The orphans now have a home All that was lost has found its place in you And you lift our weary head And you make us strong Instead, you took these rags Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm Julie Swanson, and I get the privilege of teaching this morning. Um, I've been at the Grove for, I think this is our 11th year, um, a long time. My husband is Scott Swanson. He's usually more of the onstage person, more than I am. Um, so we feel um, really blessed to be here for as long as we have, and we have six kids that are sprinkled and a lot of different generations here, so um, they love it here too. So anyway, I'm really excited to be here, and I'm really excited that I get to teach on Jesus' purpose, which is teaching. Um, I am a teacher. I teach fourth grade at a school here in Chandler. So seeing Jesus and thinking about Jesus as a teacher actually comes fairly easily for me. I'm one of those people that has known that I wanted to be a teacher since I was in kindergarten. I loved school, I loved all things about school, school supplies, folders, notebooks, organizing things, um, setting goals, I was always all about that. Um, I'm not exactly sure when I realized and understood that teaching would be my purpose, from a vocational standpoint anyway. Um, of course, I had other purposes as well. Um, I wanted to get married, big goals, and have kids. But I think it was as I went through college and started taking specific classes um, of teaching that my passion for teaching started to become my purpose. 
I have not been a full-time teacher since I graduated from college. In fact, I've spent more years not being a full-time teacher than I have being a teacher. Um, so God has used um, that time and allowed me to wrestle with what my pur purpose would be in any stage of life I'm in. Um, I currently also have a son who is a senior right now, and he's wrestling with those questions. What is my purpose? Um, people asking him, what are you going to do when you graduate? What are you going to do after high school? I mean, that's the question you ask when someone's a senior, and that causes a lot of, what am I supposed to do? What do I want to do? I don't want to just do anything. And I think that's the question that we all yearn to have answered. What is my purpose? So this week, as we look at Jesus and his purpose as a teacher, I wonder at what age Jesus knew his purpose. How old was he? Now, the fact that he was God, I assume that he always knew what he wanted to be when he grew up, or he knew what he was supposed to be when he grew up. But I think that the fact that he came to teach us about his great love for us, that was the reason he came at all. I'd like to share and think about four ways or strategies that Jesus used as he taught and how we can learn from those and implement those into our relationships. And you might be thinking, well, I'm not a teacher, so maybe this doesn't really apply to me the same way. Well, it does. Because if you have anyone in your life that you pour into or that you speak any truth at all into, then I think you're a teacher whether that be your own children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, parents, friends, coworkers, there are all ways that we can um, model Jesus' teaching to the people that are in our sphere of influence. So let's get started. So the first one is a good teacher is teachable. Being teachable means that you are able to be taught. So you might be thinking, well, wait a second, if Jesus was perfect, because he was God, how could he be teachable? It may seem odd or even counterintuitive that he could be teachable or that he would need to be taught. And it's not that he needed to be taught. He did already have all knowledge from God. He didn't need to learn things. He, it was his attitude and his posture of humility that made him teachable, that he still had things to learn even in his humanness. So as he was growing up, the Bible says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. That means he got smarter, he got wiser, and his body grew. When he was 12, Jesus and his parents took a trip. They took a road trip to Jerusalem. And when they were done, when they were leaving to go home, um, Mary and Joseph assumed that Jesus was with them. He was 12, so I like to think, I've had several kids now of my own that have been 12, and I like to think of 12 as being kind of a little bit of the golden age. It's like they're, they're old enough, but not too old. You know, you can go let them do some of their own things, but they're not at the place where they think they know everything, unless you have an early bloomer 12-year-old. But I'm thinking that when they were headed back home, Mary probably thought that, like, we, Jesus can hang out with his friends, and, you know, I don't need to know where he is every second. Well, by the end of the day of them traveling back, probably when she called him for dinner, he's nowhere to be found. And then they realize, oh, our perfect son isn't with us. Great. So we're going to have to turn all the way back, a day's journey, back to Jerusalem to find him. So I don't know if you're like me, but if I leave the house and I've even turned onto the next street and realize I've forgotten something, I'm pretty, I'm pretty upset. <laughs> I'm pretty mad. So if I have to turn back a whole day's worth journey, now it is to find your child, but still. So they get all the way back to Jerusalem and it takes them three more days to find him. Three more days, that's a long time. So I'm sure that there's also the mother worry setting in as well. And when they do find him, where is he? He's in the temple. Luke 2.46 says that he was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. Of course, they were amazed at his understanding and his answers, because of course, he had all knowledge. But the point was, he was there sitting, listening, gleaning from them, being teachable. As an adult, Jesus began preaching and teaching and performing miracles, and people were amazed at what they saw and what they heard. But never in all of that do we ever see Jesus say, listen to me, because I know everything. That wasn't his approach. We do see him constantly looking to his father for help, for guidance, 
for wisdom. In fact, the night before, he chose his 12 disciples, his 12 closest people, his students. He spent all night in prayer with God, talking to him, seeking his, his guidance. He regularly made time to spend with God, especially before big life decisions. Are you teachable? Do you seek counsel and advice from someone older than you, or maybe not even older than you, but maybe someone who has more experience in something than you? Or do you assume that you kind of already know everything about that? Even if you're an expert in your field, could there be places that you could still learn something? For the last four months, one of my kids, one of my own kids, has had a behavior coach as part of his services. And part of that requirement was that I also have a coach, a parenting coach. So there are two parts of me that had feelings about this. One, there was some relief because I really desperately needed some support with this kid. But then this other part of me felt really irritated and annoyed and maybe even a little bit embarrassed about that. Because here's the thing, I just celebrated my 21st year of parenthood and so I feel like I've already tried that, I've already done that a few times, um, I've already been around the block, I feel like I'm a veteran mom. Why do I need a coach or why do I need help with now a kid who's eight years younger than this kid that I've already raised? So, and at the end of the day, he's the one who needs the behavior change, <laughs> he's the one who needs help, it's not me. So I realized that I had two options. One, I could spend one hour a week being irritated and making sure that my coach knows that, yep, I already know that, mm-hmm, yep, I already done that, mm-hmm, yep. <laughs> or I could maybe be open and maybe there would be something I could learn. Thankfully, I chose the latter and it turns out there was a little bit more for me to learn, and I did have places to grow. One of the most painful, teachable moments in one of my sessions with her was she said to me, Julie, if things are going to change between the two of you, it's going to have to be your change because he is not going to change. He's made that clear. He's not ready to change. If change is going to be initiated, it's going to be from you. <laughs> but I was like, mm, but he need, but, but she was right. Sometimes being teachable means that I will have to change first before I can start teaching. <clears throat> so being teachable also means that you have to be a lifelong learner. A lifelong meaner, mean, ugh, learner means lifelong. That means no matter how old I get, no, how, no matter how many years I'm a mother, there will always be things that I can learn. There will always be areas I need to grow. That's never going to end. And if you're like me, the older you get, <laughs> to some degree you realize the more I do not know, <laughs> the more I do need to learn. Okay, the second thing is a good teacher asks questions. In our study this week, we looked at Luke 10, where a law expert asked Jesus, what he needs to do to inherit eternal life. Jesus responds with, what is written in the law? How do you read it? In other words, what do you think? He could have just told him the answer, but he put the question back on him so that he would have to think through the law and actually verbally explain it. Asking a question forces someone to think for an answer. As a teacher, giving all the answers is called spoon feeding. So as a baby, you were spoon-fed because you didn't know anything. You didn't know how to do anything. As you got a little bit older, you started to realize, oh, I can pick up food off my mom's plate and put it directly into my mouth. Cool. Then you got a little bit older and you started to use utensils, which is a mom's favorite stage when their kid can finally start using a spoon, right? Then as you got even older, you were able to start finding ingredients and making your own meals and feeding yourself. Learning is the same way. Yes, there are times that we're going to just need an answer, but sometimes asking a question is the best way for someone to learn. And a good teacher is sensitive 
to know when a question is actually more beneficial. Sometimes the best lesson learned is when a student can answer their own questions. Think about the woman who had the bleeding disorder. All she had to do was touch Jesus' cloak and she was healed. And what did Jesus say? He asked her, who touched me? And it's not because he didn't know who it was. He knew it was her. But there was a purpose in his question. He wanted to draw her out and he wanted her to identify herself. He wanted to show her, there's no magic in my cloak. It was your faith that healed you. Sometimes it's our questions that lead to the truth. So there is a flip side, though, to asking good questions. If you ask a good question, you also have to be a good listener. Sometimes we can ask a good or even right question, but before the person even has time to comprehend the question, we've already fired another question, or we've already given this burning information that just came to us that we've got to say right now. We can actually inhibit someone's ability to learn by interrupting their thinking space. That quiet space, though, can make us feel uncomfortable. It takes practiced self-control to keep our mouths shut. The key word there, practiced. And that means that we're going to make mistakes, a lot of them. My Nicole, my coach, she reminds me of this often because I'm really working on this skill at home. I remind my little students, you're going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes. You see them. But mistakes are an opportunity to learn. And since we're teachable, that's okay. Do you ask good questions? And maybe more importantly, are you a good listener? The third thing that a good teacher does is tells good stories. The expert of the law that asked Jesus how to have eternal life probed Jesus a little bit further. He actually wanted some detailed confirmation of who technically, actually, specifically is my neighbor. So the first time Jesus answers him with a question. The second time Jesus answers him with a story. And it goes like this. This is from Luke 10, verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to the inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. This story is full of lots of good stuff. But the part I want to focus on is Jesus' approach. Why didn't Jesus tell him, your neighbor is anyone who needs your help, regardless of their race, popularity, social status, or how much money they have? When I read that story out loud to you, you probably got a picture in your mind of a road, of a man, people passing by, because that's what a story does. It creates a picture it creates a picture or a scenario that helps our brains organize and understand information. Jesus did this all the time. They're called parables. They're simple stories that take familiar places, people, objects, and they help someone be able to connect in relevant ways to them. A story gives the listener space to process what they're learning. Think about the people that you have an opportunity to speak into the lives of. What language do they speak? Not necessarily English or Spanish or French, though it could be that. But to really know your flock, you have to know what's important to them, what's relevant to them, what they connect with. For example, recently at school where I teach, I was teaching a math lesson on the distributive property of division. And if you're anything like me, you just had an adverse reaction to those words. 
Um, I regularly have to ask the math angels to sing over me as I teach math because I carry some PTSD from high school geometry, algebra, um, basically every math class I've ever taken. Um, and right now, some of you are just really glad I'm not your child's teacher. <laughs> so I'm trying to explain the logical, sensical reason that we would want to divide 96 divided by 6 as 60 divided by 6 plus 36 divided by 6. So in order to do this, well, and the reason that I would want to teach the distributive property is because we all live and learn in different ways, and this might be an easier way for you to divide than just to just divide it. So in order to do this, I have to show them that 96, so 9 tens and 6 ones is the same as 60, 6 tens, and 30, 3 tens, and 6 ones. Because that's going to be a lot easier than just dividing it normally. So I look at their faces, and I have this on my document camera, and I'm projecting it on the screen, and I'm trying to, it's like a whole body experience as I'm trying to show them there's, there's this, and then it comes down, and it brackets into this, and I've got pictures. And I look at their sweet faces, and I just see nothing. <laughs> even the high ones, I'm like, come on. Nothing, their faces are blank. I even do my, you know, give me a thumbs up if you're picking up what I'm putting down. And, you know, not one of them. And I'm like, Great, they don't get it. And I can't go on to the next step if they don't get this step because math. So I, I pray, Jesus, help me. I don't, I don't know what to do. And then I spot on the counter our Valentine's cookies for our Valentine's party later. And miraculously, the story comes. So I take the two boxes of cookies or the packages. They're the, the Walmart cookies, you know, you can see through it and the sugar cookies. So we have two of them. I put them in front of the class and I say, okay, so let's pretend, and of course this is real because this really happened, but let's pretend that Dylan brought in one package of cookies. And let's say Damien brought another package of cookies for our party. Let's count how many cookies are in each package. Okay, so, oh, there's 21 cookies in this package. Cool. All right, let's look at this one. Ah, and it happens to be the same package because you both must have gone to Walmart and got the same package of cookies. So guess what? Oh, there's 21 cookies in this package too. Okay, so how many cookies do we have all together in both packages? 21 plus 21 or 21 times two, 42 cookies. Great, okay. So now let's say I take 10 cookies out of this package and I put it into this package. How many cookies do I have in this package of cookies now? We had 21. We add a 10, we have 31, perfect. Now, how many cookies do I have left in this package? We had 21, I took 10 away. Okay, now I have 11. Okay, great. Now, have I lost any cookies? Or do I still have all the cookies? Right, I still have all the cookies. No cookies were lost in this experiment, none. I still have 42 cookies. So what happened? I just reorganized the cookies. That's all that happened. And then I hear this sound. I hear, oh. And I was like, they got it. <laughs> then I got the thumbs up. They all got it. What happened is I just had to talk about cookies. And fourth graders can understand cookies. They didn't understand the PowerPoint, but they could understand it in the context of cookies. And I will tell you, as a teacher, there is no sweeter sound than when I hear, oh, I just feel like everything is worthwhile in my life <laughs> when I hear it. <laughs> when Jesus explained what it looked like to love, really love your neighbor to that law expert in a context that he could understand, and then asks him in verse 36, Jesus asks him, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the law expert says, the one who had mercy on him. It was like he went, ah. Oh. And I really got to believe that Jesus must have been like, yes, he got it. But I had to paint the picture in a story that he could understand. It can be easy and maybe comfortable for us only to share to, with others what we understand and how we understand it. Because I understood the tens and the ones for the most part. But Jesus showed us that a good teacher shares truth in ways that are meaningful and relevant to the ears who really need to hear it. 
So the last thing today is a good teacher teaches to the whole person. We spent quite a bit of time this week studying Jesus's purpose being to teach, and then within that, his purpose within his teachings. And that is, it's all about our hearts. Jesus was in constant discussions with Pharisees and priests, law experts, on how to uphold the law. What is permissible? How can I live a righteous life? What is an unforgivable sin? And Jesus always came back to the same thing. The key to living a righteous life, it's about your heart. How can you truly love your neighbor or take it a step further, love your enemies? That depends on the condition of your heart. How do you interact with and treat your spouse and your kids? That is a heart issue. About a month ago, I had my yearly observation where my principal came in and watched me teach math because naturally I'm such a good math teacher. And after that, a couple weeks later, I had my post-conference meeting, which I was very nervous about because I was thinking about, oh, I wish I had said this. I wish I'd explained it more this way. I wish I hadn't stumbled on that. And, and I totally forgot the engagement strategy that I wrote in my lesson plan that I boasted that I was going to use. I completely didn't do that. So I'm sure he's going to bring that up. Um, but what actually ended up happening is I was able to share my struggle to teach academics when I'm constantly trying to meet the social and emotional needs and the varying learning styles of the students in my class. Kids come in with a variety of learning styles, home issues, um, confidence and anxiety issues, a varying social um, issues. And probably the most trying part is the share needs that they have. Many days, I feel like it is, some, is nothing short of a miracle that I am able to teach anything at all when I have all of those things happening all at the same time every single day, all the time. And this year, of course, <laughs> has not helped with all of our COVID limitations and the changes we've had to make. It's made it even harder. But as we talked about through this meeting, we talked about how teaching is so much more than just teaching math and writing and reading. Because the bottom line is we're teaching people. They aren't these little robots that I'm just pushing information into. Um, I have this sign that I have hung up in my classroom. If you'll be able to hang that up there. And I hang it up here. I hang it up there because I always want to remember and for my students to know how important they are, who they are becoming that it isn't just me telling them everything I know. I want them to know that when you walk in the door, you are kind, you're a leader, you are a friend, you're teachable, you're a hard worker, and more importantly, you are loved. Jesus told that story to the law expert because he knew that he needed to see a picture of a person who was hurt and helpless and ignored. He needed to hear different types of people who encountered this person and how they treated him. He needed to understand that the one who treated him and loved him as a neighbor was the one who stopped, the one who took pity on him, and the one who took action. He could have just walked by and been about his day like everybody else, but it's because his heart was tender that he was able to stop and care for this person. It's about transforming his heart. So after the law expert gets it, his, uh, Jesus says something even more life-changing for him. He says, go and do likewise. Don't just keep all this knowledge for yourself, all this understanding of what to do. Apply it. Do something with it. Go and identify who your neighbor is. Who needs your help? Who needs your friendship? Who needs just to simply be seen and noticed? Jesus always teaches in a way that communicates truth in relevant ways. He talks straight to the heart, to the matter, and he challenges us to take action. Don't just stay the same. Let the truth change and transform you and ultimately set you free. You might feel like me sometimes and get caught up in the task of sharing your life with others to only see the parts of someone that needs fixing, to only see the behaviors that need to be changed or that attitude that needs serious adjusting. 
Let's challenge ourselves and ask God to, and ask him to show us those people he's put in our, in our paths, his children, his creation, and teach and lead by his example. Um, you have some discussion questions at your table, and they kind of go through each of the four things that I talked about today, and there's multiple questions with each question, so don't feel like you need to answer each question. Just find the ones that connect with you the best and with what you feel led to talk about. Um, and I hope you'll be able to unpack these strategies a little bit more as you listen and learn from each other to this morning. I'm going to close this in prayer, and then you can get to it. Thank you, God for this morning. Thank you for this change in my morning that I get to spend with big people. And um, I just appreciate the opportunities you give us to model who you are. Thank you for the people you've put in our paths, the people you've put in our lives that we can pour into. Help us to ask good questions. Help us to tell good stories. Bring to our minds the things to say. Help us to look to you and to trust you with our words. Thank you for our relationships, and we pray over our discussion time this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.